We do want to welcome on Colby Newton to the program. Colby, welcome to the show. Uh, Colby is the author of a new book coming out July the 16th called SEC Football, How a Regional League Became a National Obsession. Colby, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today, my friend. Yeah, it's great to be with you guys. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes. It's a big Absolutely. deal. Did you, you see my now my now vintage <laughs> hat here, Colby? Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, he don't know the definition of vintage, uh, Colby. It, it, this, this is no longer the logo, Corey, so it's now vintage. <laughs> What's yeah, the time frame like... on vintage? There's no way that's vintage, bro. Like, what are we arguing here, man? Sorry <laughs> to do this in front of company, Kobe. What's up, yeah, man? Yeah. How you doing? Nice <laughs> to meet you. <laughs> I'm doing good, so. I'm that Utah good. ball back there got me a little, you know, PTSD. Mm. You're yeah, Utah guy? Last, uh, last year. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, it was, it was a one-one split, right? Utes yeah. lost in uh, the swamp and mm-hmm. and uh, didn't get it done up here last year. Yeah, that's yeah. all right. That's all right. So, Colby, um, wanted to chat. Uh, new book coming out. Uh, like we mentioned, July sixteenth. Uh, you go through the history of the SEC and and how it became, you know, one of the dominant, if not well, it is the most dominant right now brand in college football and probably college athletics as a whole. Talk to us a little bit about the premise of the book and. And maybe some some interesting things that you found about its its rich history. Yeah, so uh, I'm an outsider of the SEC, uh, but a huge college football fan, and was in the bowl game industry for 15 years, and had the opportunity to stand on the sidelines of some of the biggest games, uh, BCS championship games in New Orleans, and, and other bowl games as well. So, uh, just kind of started to look at what what made the SEC what it is now. I think we kind of take for granted that it's the dominant conference, but how did this happen? And when you look at uh, the last 30 years compared to the 30 years before, so 1960 ish to about 1990, uh, there were six national championships won by the sec in the next 30 years. So 1990 until present day, there were triple that amount. They doubled the amount of number one NFL draft picks. They doubled the amount of Heisman trophy winners. How did that happen? And was there a narrative story that would be interesting to tell um, to, to explain to everybody, both inside the SEC and also from uh, an outside perspective of, of what happened and what are the steps that led to that mm. taking place. What what did you find out? Because it seems like the SEC has the most brand association to it from its member organizations and fans. Um, you don't hear a lot of Big Ten chants. You don't hear a lot of ACC chants unless it's done in a kind of a trolling manner. Where do you, where do you think the connection became so prevalent with the SEC where there's such a strong bind between the fans, the programs, and the uh, the conference itself? That's a really good question. I went all the way back. The first couple of chapters lay out how the SEC was formed and some of the, the things that happened back even in the 1920s and 1930s. The, the biggest one was Alabama winning the Rose Bowl. They weren't even supposed to be invited to that. Five or six teams from the North turned down the invitation and Alabama wins that game, and uh, on their train ride back, they had to stop in different cities. And one of the cities that they stopped in, the first one was New Orleans, and there were 5,000 students from Tulane that were there celebrating Alabama's win. So this passion for football in the South goes beyond just the, the teams, like you say, and is really a, a regional and conference affiliation. It goes back 100 years. Um, and so that's something that was fun to kind of discover and see that it hasn't always been that way with other leagues, like you said. And the SEC and the Big Ten have always kind of had this rivalry that goes back 100 years as well. The SEC made decisions going back to putting games on the radio in the 1930s that the Big Ten wouldn't do. Uh, we talk about that. We talk about bowl games being something the SEC really leaned into in the 40s, 50s and 60s. The Big Ten refused to do that. Um, and so those are, I think, really set the foundation for why the South cares so much about it. We talk a little bit about that there weren't a lot of pro teams in the South mm-hmm. as well, like mm-hmm. there were in the North. Um, and, and that uh, is something that I think paid a, 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 or contributed a lot to that as well. That's a SEC charter member, Tulane. Uh, <laughs> many people don't know that Tulane was one of the uh, inaugural members of the SEC. It has to be just devastating to be a charter member of the SEC and what, what conference is Tulane in? CUSA? The, the all Mer- American? Uh, they're in the AAC, right? I don't yeah. know, but I don't know. That's the point. I don't know. Wasn't, wasn't Sewanee a, a charter member of the SEC too, or did I make that up? They were, they were uh, as chartered with 13 members. 
Yes, yeah, uh, think uh, about Suwanee now, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Suwanee was the team that Georgia beat and says <laughs> that it was Florida to start the rivalry. But then again, that's the kind of passion you have uh, in the SEC. You've got two uh, of the flagship institutions in a conference can't even agree on the number of times their football teams have played a game. Yeah, it's all part of it, right? It makes it great. We actually talk about that in the book a little bit and add Georgia Tech in there as well. Why why mm-hmm. these why these schools leave? It's it's unfathomable now. And they sure. left for different reasons, but um that, that was definitely a part of the foundation of of where the SEC is today. They stuck at 10 members for so long. And I think that helped the conference. Uh, and then they obviously kicked off a lot of the conference expansion, which is a huge part of the book with South Carolina and Arkansas in the late eighties. What's uh? Oh, what is there anything unique you find about uh, the University of Florida's presence in, in, in the SEC and how much we contributed to what it is now? Huge part of the book is Steve Spurrier, as you can imagine, both as a player and as a coach. And there were a lot of really fun things that that we discovered, and maybe Florida fans already know it. Again, kind of writing from an outsider's perspective of how Spurrier even ended up at the University of Florida. He was thinking about staying uh, staying home and going to Tennessee. Uh, he thought about going to Alabama because of Bear Bryant and playing for, for Bear mm-hmm. Bryant. And uh, it was a, a, a U.S. postmaster that told the coach, Ray Graves, at the time to check out this skinny kid from Tennessee. And as everybody knows now, Spurrier went to Gainesville and fell in love with the, the community and, and the weather and, and all of that. And he also wanted to make a name for himself, which he wouldn't have done at Alabama. If Spurrier doesn't go to Florida, I don't know where the Gator program is right now because obviously he goes, he wins a Heisman Trophy. They have a ton of success. And then he really didn't bring that success back until he came back as a head coach and uh, uncovered some really cool stories there as well. One of them that, that maybe you guys already know is how he got Bob Stoops to be his defensive coordinator. He, he wanted Stoops. He, he Stoops was a, an assistant at Kansas State at the time. He calls up the Kansas State offices and says, this is Steve Spurrier. I need to talk to Bob Stoops. They wouldn't put him through. So he calls again. They still don't put him through. Well, knowing Spurrier, he's like, all right, I'll figure something else out. He calls a third time and pretends to be someone else <laughs> that he knows I like it. that the uh, receptionist will put him through. Yeah, yeah. And he says, hey, this is so-and-so. They put him through. He gets Stoops on the line. He says, Stoops, this is Steve Spurrier. You need to come be my DC and, you know, kind of the rest is history. So a lot of little nuggets in there. That That's kind of what – the games are cool, but it's the stuff behind the scenes that I like yeah. to write about and, and that I discovered. So the, the SEC is not where it is today without Spurrier building that uh, powerhouse mm-hmm. in the 90s because that was right after expansion happened. Mm-hmm. It was right after – uh, the championship game, which we look back on it now and we're like, yeah, no brainer. Nobody wanted the championship game inside right. or outside the conference. The coaches were furious about it. Right. So Spurrier builds this powerhouse right at this time. This stuff's going on. SEC on CBS is another big part of the book. And Florida was a huge, huge part of that. So uh, foundation for the conference is uh, a, a lot, a lot of Gator in it. Yeah, the uh, for me, uh, born in '88, the uh, into a Gator family. Uh, it was Spurrier Fulmer uh, every September, and the the course of who was going to play in Atlanta was almost decided in you know the third week of the season. Um, but there's probably so many um, Steve Spurrier Fulmer, um, of course Nick Saban, um, Les Miles names. There's a ton of characters. Was there a a particular character that maybe stood out to you, whether it was from Florida or somebody else as like, who is this person as you, you dealt, you delved into them. Spurrier is tough to beat. Uh, he's got a lot of really, really good stories um, in there. Uh, we talk a lot about urban Meyer, how he ended up at Florida, uh, how he got Tim Tebow. Uh, you guys might know the story of Tebow's on the phone telling Spurrier, he's going to come to Florida and the phone drops. And he doesn't know if he's going to say he's coming to Florida or not. So little things like that. But I would say Roy Kramer, um, the the commissioner in the, the 90s, is a character that I didn't realize had the grit that he had to stand up to everybody when they said, no, this is crazy. We're not doing a championship game. 
we're, we're not going to expand. And he didn't care. And he just stood up and said, no, this is what we're going to do. And it's going to change this league. And it did. And if there's no Roy Kramer character, um, I mean, he's he's tabulating the BCS formula on his kitchen table to start when that whole thing came out. And, and, and so there, there's all these little things that Kramer did that really helped put the SEC above everybody else instead of just mm. on the same line. What what else did you learn? And I know you mentioned Urban Meyer, and obviously, um, you know, a lot of fond memories there too. He brought uh, instant success, uh, you know, to the SEC as an outsider. Uh, what did you learn about Urban Meyer? Obviously, a lot of people have seen the stories. Uh, they saw Swamp Kings. They they saw his kind of rise and demise, and then rise and then demise i guess multiple times uh since then but what what did you find out about urban meyer that that made him so successful to be able to put florida back on the map as as quickly as as he did or just about him as a person yeah the two things that stand out and this isn't going to be news to anybody is his work ethic his mm -hmm. work ethic was uh was was world famous one of my the funny stories that, that i uncovered was when he was a, a brand new assistant in the midwest and Nick Saban got the head coaching job um, in Ohio and uh, at Toledo and Urban called up Nick Saban out of the blue with no um, prior you know, knowledge of him. Didn't didn't talk to him. Talked to Miss Terry, Nick Saban's yeah. wife, felt like he'd convinced her that he was going to get a job on his staff. And she can't he came home. Uh, Saban came home and, and his wife told him about this kid, Urban Meyer. And he never called him back. And, and so it's like little things like that, that nothing was going to stop him mm -hmm. from building the program that he knew he could build at Florida. And the other thing is recruiting. Right. I, I mean, he just he changed him and Saban changed the game with recruiting for the SEC in the early 2000s. And I don't believe that you have a national championship at Auburn with Cam mm -hmm. Newton. I don't think you have a national championship. Um uh, with LSU and, and, and Miles without what Urban was doing because it rose levels to the whole conference. And that's where I think the difference is with the Big Ten. The Big Ten's got two teams. Penn State just hasn't been able to rise up to that. Wisconsin, you know, Nebraska's disappeared. The SEC hasn't done that. You know, you've still got the Alabama and the Georgia, but you've got the, the, all these other programs that win natties too. And Florida's mm -hmm. obviously one of those, that that's what I think separates it. And that's what Urban brought to the league. I think it's an just a, an important question now with everything that's happening, the, the landscape of college football changing, the amount of conference alignment that we're still talking about, uh, and just a lot of the moves that the NCAA and, and college football particularly are having. What do you think is the future of the SEC over the next five to ten years, which I know can be the matter of – like two months in, in real life now. Uh, but what do you see as the future of the SEC, college football conferences? Uh, because that's the probably the one thing that the SEC has had is while they've expanded and added Oklahoma and Texas, for the most part, it's pretty congregated in like the southeastern quadrant, if you will, of the United States. But what do you see with football realignment and everything else happening over the next you know few years changing the SEC and then ultimately changing college football? Yeah, that's the golden question, right? What, what's going to happen? And you've got these two monster conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC, approaching it in very different ways. The SEC has continued to do what they've always done, which is to keep it uh, in congruous states, states that are touching each other. Now you got Texas and Oklahoma coming in, and the Big Ten's doing a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that anybody knows what's going to happen, much the same way in the late 80s. Nobody knew what South Carolina and Arkansas are going to do to the SEC, what's the championship game going to do? Nobody could foresee that it would put it on this pedestal. I personally don't think what the Big Ten is doing is going to work long term the same way it will with the SEC because it's just too far spread out and it's going to dilute it. Uh, you're not going to get as excited about a UCLA Indiana game as you are a Texas Mississippi State game. Just mm -hmm. again from an outsider's perspective, and and so that's where I think five to ten years from now. I think the SEC is just going to continue to do what they do and they know what they do and lean into that. And the, and the other leagues feel a little bit scattered. So that's what I think is going to happen. I'm fired up for uh, some midweek UCLA Rutgers baseball, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that that women's tennis flight between mm. Washington yeah. and Rutgers is going to hit like crack. Um, <laughs> well, it's funny. If I could just throw one more story in there, when the SEC yeah. signed with CBS, nobody thought that was going to work because it was the first time that a national network, uh, over-the-air network, put the game on in the entire country. The ABC was regionalizing. Mm. So the ABC executive at the time, that's like 96, 95, said, Nobody in Colorado is going to care about Tennessee playing Florida. He couldn't have been more wrong, right? Everybody yeah, cares. Yeah. Whether you love the SEC or you hate the SEC, you care about the SEC. You don't care about Rutgers playing UCLA. It, there's just no Football in the South, it, it just means more down here, man. It really does. Uh, it just Kobe, means more penance. So two more <laughs> penance. I don't know what pennants you got, but that thing is not vintage, bro. Like I don't know what that is. I think I think the book is a great idea. Uh, I'm a I'm an avid book reader. I think it's a great idea, especially how much college football is changing, and these kids are not gonna know like what what our football looked like. The conferences, like all this, is good to document. How many books have you written? This is my second book. This is just okay. my second okay. book. Yep. Okay. Hopefully, what, many more. What motivated you to write this one? Love college football, love the SEC, and uh, I, I love to find these little nuggets, these little stories. I'm a huge history buff, so I like to look back and kind of try and figure out why is this the way it is, and uh, hopefully people enjoy it. Really excited to get it in people's hands. The ESPN is taking over the SEC starting next year, so that CBS relationship that that so many uh, correlate back to just so many great memories of Vern Lundquist and Gary Daniels and or Dan Danielson and, and the rest. What do, you, what do you think that that does outside of bringing a, I mean, a metric shit ton more money for the SEC? But do you think that that hurts anyway, or is it just it is what it is? It's just life now. I think it could hurt a little bit. That was actually the, the, the genesis of the book is SEC on CBS. I mean, I'm from the West. So out here at 1.30 on a Saturday afternoon, I cleared my schedule and I watched, I sat down and watched CBS uh, uh, to see the SEC. Uh, Vern Lundquist endorsed the book, which was a, a great thrill for me to have Man. Vern Lundquist, you know, say that he read it and loved it. So I, I think it will take a minute for you, people outside the South to realize, oh, it's not on CBS anymore. Right. We got to find it somewhere else. Yeah, that CBS intro to the Ohio State yes. Michigan game or whatever just was just not. I mean, you no. got to retire the music, you know. Yeah. Got to hang that slap. one in the rafters. Did not slap. Uh, so, Colby, before we get you out of here, uh, remind everybody uh, where they can follow you, get the book, um, and and do a quick shot for yourself. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Colb Newton. You can buy the book right now. Pre-order it on Amazon, on BarnesandNoble.com and the publisher's website, which is roman.com. But if you love college football, if you like history, and if you like the SEC, you're going to love the book. I think it's a great read. Awesome. Well, Colby, we appreciate you coming on today. We will be absolutely sure to read your book uh, here in the next couple of weeks. And uh, maybe after the uh, book comes out, uh, we can have a few readers, uh, you know, get, get it out. Pardon me. Have a few people read it and get back on the show uh, to discuss a few of the things that uh, that you wrote about it. But we're excited to, uh, to have it. And thanks so much for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me on and uh, look forward to talking with you again. Awesome. Thank you, Colby. Thanks so much, Colby. The book. Take it thanks easy. a lot, man. I thought it was Shane Matthews when he first came on. I was like, yo. Oh, Colby. I got to... Like um, it looks like Shane a little bit, man. I I try not you try not to do this uh, in the press box, but I remember the first time I saw Vern Lundquist and Gary Danielson like, like back in 2013. Didn't say anything. And then when we knew it was going to be Vern's last season... I can't remember what game it was. It might have been George, Florida, Georgia, uh, his last season, but like stopped him uh, and and in the press box and talked to him, uh, hmm. just like thanked him. Like <clears throat> whether people oh. give him people give him like such a hard time, but like that's the Gary Danielson, Vern Lundquist is like the voice I grew yeah, up bro. listening yeah. to. Legendary dog. Like, yeah. So uh, it was really cool meeting Vern. Really, really. Maybe nice we guy. could ask Cole. Ran into, into him in Augusta as well. Ah, of course you did. Uh, maybe we can ask Colby for an introduction to Vern. That would be an elite guest to have on the show. No, that'd be a fire guest. I got a lot of questions. 